My guest this week on Behes with Barkha is well-known author Atish Tasir, who has made the national and international headlines these past few days after the government decided to strip him of his OCI card or his overseas citizenship identity. Now, this Atish believes is because he has written a cover story for Time magazine that was critical of the government and of the Prime Minister. The government has argued back saying that Atish Tasir withheld critical information and have focused on the fact that Atish's father Salman Tasir was Pakistani and accused Mr. Tasir of not having disclosed this fact while applying for his OCI card. Since then, among others who have appealed for the government to renew their decision is Atish's aging grandmother whose video has also been shared and gone viral on social media. Atish Tasir is our guest this evening and joins us from New York. Welcome to the program, Atish. Let me. Um, let me start by asking you, uh, why are you so sure of the causal relationship between uh, what has happened with your OCI card and the story that you wrote for Time magazine? Because it has been a few months since you wrote that story. The story was well before the elections. Right. Well, firstly, you have to realize that when I think I even came on your show at the time and I kept saying, Barca, that I was worried not about the trolling, not about the vandalizing of my Wikipedia page, not about the frenzy that the that sort of Modi's followers sort of went into when I wrote that story. What I was worried about was Sambit Patra using his megaphone to advance the lie that I was a Pakistani and the prime minister picking up this lie. I, I At the time, I felt that it was a year of hostilities between the two countries and that you were one, in one way or the other exposing me in a way and using something that was frankly completely untrue. You, for instance, have known me for most of my life and you know that I'm not a Pakistani and that I've really lived and grown up in India all my life with my single mother. So, uh, Atish, let me put to you what the government has said. And I know what a lot of viewers must have seen or read. The government says that this has nothing to do with any article you wrote. The government says that they discovered that when you applied uh, for your OCI card, you did not disclose that Salman Tasir, your biological father, though you've been brought up uh, by a single mom, namely Tablin Singh, uh, was your father. And that the rules very clearly say that if someone has a father or a grandfather or grandparent who is Pakistani or Pakistan linked, they cannot apply for an so, OCI so, card. Let me, stop you there. let me stop you there. Firstly, my father's name is on the OCI that I surrendered on Monday. So I'm certainly not lying about the fact that Salman Tasir was my father. What is in contention that the government has brought up is not anything that I've done in the first place. It's an application made by my mother in 2000 for a PIO. When I was in college abroad, she went for, she'd been applying simultaneously over the years to, to have status for me because I was growing up alone with her. She came forward to, as a single mother, and what they're saying that we didn't provide was my father's citizenship document, which we could never have provided because we were estranged from him. And what's more, the government didn't mind. The government thought it was fine, issued the document. If it was so essential, if we were concealing such vital information, why was the document issued? Moreover, you, as you can tell, like any government has a world of legalese and bureaucracy, but a government is also able to look at a broader context and it was so clear from the fact that I have written books and articles and in many, many platforms made it perfectly clear what the nature of my relationship with my father was. They never once came forward. It never mattered. And if I was engaging in the behavior of concealment, I was obviously going about it in a very silly way. And mm -hmm. I, want to say, I want to say one more thing, Barca, because this is like what they're trying to do is weaponize a technicality. They're trying to weaponize the law to use it against their critics. Do you know that according to the OCI laws, you can't do journalism. You can't apparently do mountaineering. You, if, you, if a government wants to get play tough ball, it has many, many resources at its, at it, at its, at its fingertips. So, so let's not confuse the malice of the way that they behave towards me. So, so, so let me understand what you're saying. You're saying that at the time that the OCI card was applied for, you did not conceal the fact that you are Salman Tasir's son. Uh, you could not have provided, you're arguing, uh, the papers that showed that he was a Pakistani citizen because you did not have a legal relationship and even any other relationship uh, came many years later, I believe. I read about this when you went to Pakistan to try and, uh, you know, discover that side of your family. When I, when I wrote Stranger to History, 
My father sent us legal notice saying that, we, that, that he was never married to my mother. We were never a family. We never lived together. It was a totally, this was, this is a woman who brought me up on her own and she would never, I mean, she, she, why would she reveal his name? Why would he be, his name be on my document? Why would I be writing articles if what I wanted to do was concealment? And let me tell you, the way the government could, could certainly have asked for clarification, they could have asked, what they did was they issued me a notice with 24 hours for me to provide the information, which my husband is a lawyer, so as best he could, he did do that. They, I didn't hear a word then from government, complete silence. The consul general acknowledged my reply, but nothing from the home ministry. And the consul general said, this is coming from the home ministry. He said in no unclear terms. Then a couple of months go by, and we find out that the government is leaking information to the press. The story breaks, and the government gets on Twitter. And before they've informed me, they cancel my document on Twitter. And they, they've used this particular way of concealment or fraud because it gives them the grounds to blacklist me. So I can't actually then apply for a normal visa for India. So let me ask you this. I, I, I did follow the sequence of events, but there is a, an ongoing discussion, a robust one here in India. And there are many people who've stood up for you. Uh, but even among those people, there's some amount of disquiet about what they see. Uh, and you must have read these articles is your entitlement. They're saying, look, Atish is saying I've been sent into exile, but he's actually not Indian. He, uh, he was British. He now lives in New York. And OCI card is not the same as citizenship. So why does he use words like exile? Uh, which is the word you used when you wrote in Time magazine. How do you respond to that, 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 that you, know, you are this elite person of privilege, you in fact chose not to be an Indian citizen, and now you are locating this conversation within the framework of losing citizenship? Many different things going on here, firstly, Barkha. Like, whether I'm elite or not, the fact that I can't see my mother and my grandmother, that's a pretty, like, painful thing to have happen to anyone. I mean, I, I wouldn't like to think class warfare has got to the point where we're like, oh, this person is privileged, so he can just he can just be denied entry to the country he grew up in, the country where his work is steeped in. Any other country would honor a writer like me who's been completely embedded in Indian life, who's lived in India most of his life. Now, coming to this other point that you raised, actually at the age of 18, you can ask my mother, I was very ready to become an Indian citizen, and at that point, at that very moment, this scheme came up, which seemed to make it that there was no longer an either or situation. In fact, the government was welcoming people with hyphenated identities to become part of Indian life. And I took advantage of that. So, so it's a bit crazy to be like, oh, he didn't. And now, and I've thought about it very seriously, two things. If I was to become an Indian citizenship on, citizen, on one hand, I would be putting my hand, myself in the hands of a government that has already shown itself to be malicious towards me. And secondly, I would be becoming the citizen of a country that doesn't recognize my marriage. And so these are very serious things when you're considering. I, my husband, for instance, would have very serious reservations at this point. But let's mm -hmm. not make any mistake that I was, oh, not interested in becoming Indian. I have been learning Indian languages, Indian literature. I have done everything I can to show, to, to, to show my commitment to Indian life and anyone who would read any of my books, that, that would be abundantly clear. So let me ask you this. You say that you, uh, you, know, you feel you can't come and meet your mother and grandmother. You must have seen the commentary that says that, look, you can still come, like a, you know, come as a tourist like anybody else. Do you actually believe that this government decision is going to mean that you can't come? The, the consul general said to me, he said, if the OCI is taken away on these grounds, we cannot issue you a standard visa. And if you look at my Twitter timeline, it says very clearly on the Home Ministry's website that such a person will be blacklisted and denied. They use the word blacklisted and denied further entry into India. So, so these this people, moment, they make no yeah. mistake about what is going on here. And as you can see, I'm, not, I'm an individual, but this stuff is starting to roll out in different ways. We, we, I think the Maida Patkar story has broken today. We've heard of another case, some, someone in Telangana. We know that the CAB is coming before. So the, 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 if you don't think that the, if the, 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 the plates are moving, that the so lines are being changed to, to make India, to sort of remake Indian identity, like, and to use 
Indian laws to go after critics. I mean, I don't know what world we're living in. This, this picture is so clear. In newspaper after newspaper in the world today, we're talking about the slide of Indian democracy into something illiberal, into something that more resembles Turkey than what India has stood for in the past. And, and I believe I'm, I'm probably one casualty in this, in this transformation. Atish, uh, you know, you're, you are locating what's happened with you uh, in the larger uh, sort of shifting sands of India and, 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 and that's a fair argument to make. But the appeal from your grandmother was a very personal appeal. And in fact, one of the things she said in that video is that she has been a fan, uh, a supporter of Prime Minister Modi. Uh, your mother, uh, who's not known for pulling her punches and criticizes the government when it's necessary, has overall been a supporter of Prime Minister Modi. Do you see an, you know, an irony then in the situation that you're in? Because while you may have been critical, you, you have formally been a supporter a few years ago. Uh, and, and certainly your mother and grandmother you know, have gone on record to say that they have been supporters of this government. How do you make sense of all of that when you join the dots? I think, I mean, I, I, if you mean we don't have a leg to stand on, probably... No, 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 I wasn't saying that. I wasn't saying that. I was just pointing, I was just pointing to the irony of the situation. Yeah, no, it is an irony and, and everyone, has, have, everyone has responded in their own ways. We haven't really... My grandmother wanted to say something. It's a, it, in fact, really ironically, our last conversation, my nanny and my conversation, was an argument about Modi and she was defending him and saying how important he was. And so I think she's been completely wounded by this because, firstly, she's the wife of an Indian army officer whose husband fought wars against Pakistan. She raised me at a time when she could have, the scandal of what had happened, she could have completely cut off relationships with my mother. She could have isolated me. She could have made me feel like I wasn't welcome. She did the opposite. In a complete act of Indian big-heartedness, she said, you belong here. This is your family. And she never let me believe otherwise. So for her to have... A prime minister who she supports make her grandmother ostensibly a Pakistani and unwelcome in India. I mean, she's devastated. She's 90 next year. Yeah. And, and, and where do you intend to take this from here? Are you going to fight this legally? What have your lawyers advised you? What are you planning to do next? I will fight this in every way I can at every step because everything is at stake. My country my family, my mother, my relationships to the, to the place that I work with, everything is at stake. So we'll take it course by course. There will first be, I think that, that, that my lawyers feel that, that, that we should give the opportunity, the government an opportunity to review the case. Because by the way, they are within their powers to grant an exemption. And that exemption would not be granted to me because I was elite or privileged. It would be granted to me because I'm so clearly the son of an Indian mother who's a single mother who's brought me up on her own. I've lived in India for the great part of my life. I have Aadhaar cards and fan cards and bank accounts in India. They, if an exemption was created, who was it created for except for people like me? So we are going to first give the government the opportunity to review it. Then we will have to move the courts and we'll have to do everything we can and we may well lose. But mm -hmm. just do not, do not get away from the fact that someone who you know has been a part of Indian life has suddenly been shown the door. And that should be very worrying for anybody who loves freedom and who loves what India had stood for in the past. Uh, well, how would you describe how this decision came? Were you anticipating it? Were you shocked? Uh, you did mention that when you, uh, you know, a few months ago, you had the fear uh, that this is something that could happen to you. And when it finally did happen, you've had some days to process it now. How would you, you know, what are the, you're an author, so you, you, you have a, a sort of lexicon at your disposal. How would you describe your state of mind at this moment? Um, well, two different, but the, yes, in some ways I was anticipating the decision because of the signaling. When, when Modi and pa uh, Sambit Patra started saying Pakistani, 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 I was like, they're going to come after me. And I was actually, when I returned to India in August to make my documentary, I was sort of pleasantly surprised that nothing had happened. And I was like, wow, almost out of a habit of mind, I was like, this is still, the, this is still a good country. This is still mm -hmm. a country where you can criticize the government and nothing can happen to you. Um, but, uh, but sure enough, like it, they, this, this, I was, they had a tailor-made solution for me. They've come under, uh, after numerous critics of the government in different ways. So it's, it's not as if I'm the only person in the whole sort of Modi regime who's been targeted. As for my state of mind, I surrendered uh, my document on Monday to the Indian consulate. 
And it was something that I was obviously prepared to do, I was ready to do, but it came as such a jolt because, you know, I said to the guy, I said, goodbye and Jai Hind, because I was like, I f***ing love this country. And to suddenly have to give up my status there, to suddenly not have that, that idea of that, that, that route to always be able to go back, to always write about it, to always think about it, 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 was, it was horrible. Mm. And let me, let me ask you this, when you say you're going to fight it every step of the way, do you see that fight taking place within, within India? Because it has also become an internationalized conversation. We have seen major international writers appeal to the Prime Minister, Margaret Atwood, Salman Rushdie among them. Where, where do you see the fault lines of this battle? Is it legal? Is it in the, is it in the court of public opinion? Uh, how, do you, how do you see it resolving itself? I, I think it has all of. I think what you're saying. I think it has all of these. These are all th fault lines, or all these are all theaters in which this battle would occur. And but it's not the really important side is that it's not about an individual. It's about a direction that a country is taking. And we we watched, or we stood by and watched as Turkey slid into illiberal democracy. And what that means is that that country can no longer be a friend of the free world. It's not about individual interests or issues. If we lose India, if we lose what India stands for in Asia as a bulwark against China, as a sort of citadel of freedom in Asia, we we, we lose like it it there's there there's a real there's there is a much larger story here. And so it may be that I can't return home, it may be that I'm one victim of this situation, but the broader story is far more important. Mm -hmm. And I just want to sort of underline the fact, because many people may not be aware of it, that while you're cast in the role of a critic of the Prime Minister and the government, the piece that you wrote was actually pretty scathing on India's opposition, uh, in particular on Rahul Gandhi, and, and all that appears to have, in a sense, uh, been forgotten in this entire debate. Absolutely. It's, it's a scandal what they're doing, because it's, in a sense, the BJP is where it is, and it's more and more sort of ascendant or more and more able to sort of seize power because the opposition has not responded. It, it's, it's intellectually, philosophically collapsed as an opposition. And I remember writing this at the time of the first Modi, when I heard him here speak in 2013, I said that his victory would decimate the opposition, not just electorally, but in far more profound ways. And now I hear from within, the, uh, within Congress circles that once again, they're going to bring Rahul Gandhi before the people. It is just insane because you then haven't even begun, the, you haven't even begun that work, that basic work of reconstituting yourself as an opposition, which in 10 years might yield electoral results. But if you don't understand that the Indian people have looked at Rahul Gandhi and they've said, no, he cannot be presented before the people again. Mm -hmm. I, and, and, and I just want to talking about the Congress and, and then looking at the whole free speech debate and what's happened with you. I do think that you know, a lot of our parties, including the Congress, have had historically terrible positions on free speech. It was a Congress government that shut down satanic verses. It was an Indira Gandhi that imposed uh, emergency. So every uh, government has had to carry its own blots, uh, as it were, when it comes to free speech. No, for sure. And it's, it's, a, it's a question of degrees, you know. The, it, it, it was, it, it's not without the Tsar and his excesses that you can imagine the Bolshevik. It's not without the Shah and his excesses that you can imagine the regime of the Ayatollah. So the world of Congress and the world of what we thought was, believe me, it was not perfect. And I think I must have spent most of my life criticizing those imperfections and of trying to bring, bring them to the surface. And it was in many ways a flawed world. But we can by degrees say that what well, we've got in its place is worse. Finally, Atish, to all the Indians who are going to be watching this, listening to you, what's the one thing that you'd want them to understand about you and this entire case? I want them to understand that an Indian writer steeped in Indian concerns, who spent most of his life in India, whose only family lives in India, has basically been put in a situation where he can no longer return home. And whether you like what I say or don't like what I say, you should be very worried that that can happen. And you think of yourself as Indian, even though technically your citizenship is not Indian. You know, why can we live in a world of hyphenated identities? Next year, I'm on my way to acquiring American citizenship. I do have a bond to America. I do have, uh, but, but 
but of course, like, you know, you can look from my books, you can look from the fact of what my concerns have been, that, that, there is, that there's a sort of baseline or a sort of substratum of identity that is completely, deeply embedded, on, like, rooted in the Indian subcontinent. Atish Tassi, if this is a case that's going to continue to attract a lot of national and international attention, we'll keep following the story. Thank you so much for joining us from New York. Thank you, Berka.